Hello, I'm Pam Melroy, and I'm delighted to be here today for Aerospace Village to talk about cybersecurity lessons learned from human spaceflight. So I'll start out by introducing myself. I am a retired Air Force uh, test pilot and a NASA astronaut. I flew three times in space on the space shuttle to the International Space Station. My first two missions, I was the pilot in the right seat, and on my final mission, I was the mission commander of the space shuttle. Now, all of my missions were to the International Space Station, and uh, this is a picture of what it looks like now in space orbiting above us at about 400 kilometers. It's an international laboratory. Now, uh, there's lots of very interesting science that you can do in microgravity as you're whizzing around in low Earth orbit, uh, experiencing uh, uh, a balancing of all the forces so it feels like there's no gravity. You don't feel the effects of gravity, even though they're there. Um, we, we discovered we could do a lot of really interesting science on the space shuttle, like uh, fluid mechanics, combustion, and even studying the human body and biology. But flying on the shuttle, uh, we only flew about six or seven times a year for about 10 days to two weeks at a time. And so the United States joined with our partners, Russia, Japan, Canada, and Europe to build the International Space Station so that we could do science 24-7, 365 days a year. And now, of course, if you look at the space station, you realize it's far too big to put on the top of a rocket and launch it. We had to bring it up a piece at a time and uh, build it as we went along. If you look in the upper left-hand corner, you can see Atlantis. Uh, from my second flight with part of the truss segment that the solar arrays sit on filling up the entire payload bay. So we carried up an element at a time and then using the robotic arm of the space shuttle and the space station, maneuvered it into position and, uh, and then bolted it down. And then we sent spacewalkers outside to make the power, cooling, and data connections. And then inside the space station, we would activate the element. Now, most of the time, uh, we actually had to upgrade the software each time that we did that on the ISS because we had new mass properties, new capabilities. And uh, so it wasn't just activating a new element, it was actually uh, constantly evolving the International Space Station command and data handling system. Now, I'd, I, after I left uh, NASA, I went on to a variety of opportunities in industry and government, uh, including spending uh, a couple of years with the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation, learning all about uh, space policy and the new emerging commercial space industry. And I spent four years at DARPA as a deputy of the Tactical Technology Office overseeing the air and space research portfolio. Space is incredibly important in our daily lives. The GPS navigation uh, that we have on our phone is just, just the beginning. Think of all the apps that use uh, GPS, agriculture, most importantly, uh, financial transactions. When you use an ATM, the timing signal is set by GPS. We also use space for national security communications throughout the world. Think about remote sensing of our Earth to study the weather, be able to predict it, and have other indicators of the health of the Earth. We've had a very complacent attitude about our satellites because physical access was basically impossible once the satellite was launched. But now we know that our key infrastructure is at threat on the ground, and it is in space as well from both physical and cyber threats. Space systems have always focused on safety and mission assurance because you can't access them, you can't repair them, and it's expensive to launch things. So we've spent a lot of time focusing on redundancy and testing and mission assurance. Now we have the commercial world coming into play, doing things faster and cheaper, and we have the potential uh, for lunar exploration. And we also have nation states competing for achievements and resources in space. So the threat is evolving. We need to understand the implications and prepare for the challenges ahead. 
I'm going to talk a little bit about the lessons learned from the software approach to human spaceflight for both the space shuttle and the space station. But first, I'd like to actually address, so what is the real threat? What could a hacker actually do to a satellite? Well, the simplest hack, of course, is a denial of service. Uh, pretty straightforward, and it's actually happening today. Jamming of signal. Sometimes it's inadvertent. Uh, just having a transmitter tuned too loudly so it's drowning other transmitters out, and sometimes it's completely intentional. You could intercept commands and data, so uh, you could understand what things the satellite is pointing at, what it's taking pictures of, see, those, uh, see that data stream for yourself, and also uh, intercept communications. There's also the potential for the man in the middle type of attacks. That's quite a bit harder, actually, with most space systems now, because uh, you would have to really understand the data stream in order to alter it. Now, could you do something crazy like send it over to hit another satellite? So if you think about a self-driving car and hacking that, you could drive it off the road. Well, not really. Most satellites don't actually carry enough propellant to maneuver over to another satellite. But what you could do is run the satellite out of fuel. Uh, you could shut down a critical system like cooling or pointing the solar arrays at the sun. Now, there are roughly 5,000 active satellites in space, but only the International Space Station has humans on board permanently. So even back in the 70s when the shuttle was being designed, there was a recognition that it was going to be different. Lives were going to be at stake. So a much higher level of attention needed to be paid to software errors that could have catastrophic consequences. So I'd like to talk about some of the lessons that we can learn from the shuttle and from ISS. Now, it's kind of easy to make fun of the space shuttle. Yes, this is a picture from my first flight. And you can see that we interfaced with the shuttle computers using a cathode ray tube screen. And uh, that, that's a blow up of what it looks like. It's uh, black with green letters on it. Uh, absolutely no, no graphics processing units or uh, uh, you know, any kind of artistry at all. It's anything that you could make with numbers and lines. And that was pretty much it. We also uh, were very limited in the way that we could communicate. We didn't have a full keyboard uh, the way most computers do. We had a small hexadecimal keyboard. Now, this actually wasn't that bad. One of the uh, very clever things um, that was done with shuttle software was the extensive use of um, bundled commands, uh, what I would, in my simplistic mind, think of as a macro. So there were many, many things that needed to have multiple uh, tasks done, say, to configure the entire vehicle uh, for a different phase of flight or to prepare for another activity. So rather than uh, throwing switches, which were you know, limited, uh, limited space, or pressing in a number or an action for every single one, you had the capability to hit item and a number and then execute on a given page, and it would set off a whole string of bundled commands. So it actually wasn't as bad uh, to interface with as you might think. Now, here's one of the areas that I really didn't like, the fault summary. So if something went wrong, this is the page that you went to. And it had a maximum of 15 faults displayed, which most of the time was, was pretty OK. But worse, it doesn't have any scrolling capability. So on my first flight, we had a malfunction. We had an electrical bus short on a payload bus that provided about one third of the power to the payload and the systems aboard the space shuttle. Now, you can imagine when that happened, every bell and whistle went off inside the space shuttle. And when I went back to look at this fault sum, I didn't, didn't have very many choices. I had to either write everything down, because when I hit reset, it was gone and I could never see it again. And uh, the messages would stack up and get lost behind each other. So definitely, um, you can see some real weaknesses in the interface area. I think that was... Uh, that was a real challenge, I think, uh, but probably very reflective of the capabilities of the 70s. The Shuttle General Purpose Computer, or GPC, was a marvel. 
really uh, incredibly rugged. So carrying a whole whopping megabyte of RAM, uh, but very, very rugged. It had to be rugged. It had to withstand the intense vibration and Gs of launch. It also had to be very radiation tolerant compared to the laptops that we carried that I'll talk about in a little bit, which uh, had constant um, cosmic ray hits and corruption of their um, of data, requiring you to reboot them typically once a day. That was not the case with the GPC. It was very, very rugged, and it was meant to be radiation tolerant. It was also highly efficient. Only 400,000 lines of code to operate the entire space shuttle. Pretty amazing, actually, that we could do that. Part of the reason for that is that code in space has weight implications. That's right. If you're doing more computations, you need more power and more cooling, which is more mass and more volume. And so efficiency in software is incredibly important in space. And the space shuttle definitely reflected that. One of the cool things about the space shuttle uh, software was that it had a very, very low error rate. So uh, I'm showing here a table from a great paper that's got the link at the bottom uh, about, you know, a reflective of the space shuttle software history. And if you look back uh, to the right-hand side there, the total error rate per case lock uh, in 1981 was about eight to nine. Uh, that's pretty darn good. And uh, within seven years, it was consistently down around one, which is an order of magnitude better than commercial software. Some would say two orders of magnitude, depending on the software. And you can see that by the time we got close to the end of the space shuttle, uh, uh, flying the space shuttle, we had gotten the error rates in our uh, new updates down to zero. Now, how in the world did we do this? Well, we kind of had to brute force it, right? It was a lot of verification and testing. So each space shuttle mission had unique software on it. Now, there was the core software, which was the same, but there were, it was actually a unique software load because you had a different payload, you had different mass properties, maybe you were going to the space station or maybe you were going to a different inclination. So for each shuttle mission, months were spent on that unique software load doing verification in SAIL, the Shuttle Avionics Integration Laboratory. And the idea behind that is you would have crews and engineers who would run through tons and tons of scenarios, lots of procedures uh, to verify that there were no unwanted changes to the software. And this is pretty amazing considering that there were no auto debugging capabilities at that time. Uh, so it was very manual intensive, but it does show that it is possible to get very, very low error rates. One of the other interesting things about the shuttle software program was that not only was verification very intense, but if a a bug or an error was found, the, the program would go back and take a look at what process escape allowed that bug to slip through. So in addition to just checking the software, they were also looking at the entire coding process to go back and see if they could trap any other bugs that were from the same process escape and plug that process escape so that future bugs would not be introduced to the system. Another aspect of the space shuttle that was really interesting and added to uh, the resiliency of the system was the flexible redundancy in uh, the software systems put into the general purpose computers. So we carried five GPCs aboard the space shuttle. Four of them were loaded with the primary avionics software system known as PASS, and one computer was loaded with backup flight software or BFS. That software was developed completely independently. It was a separate company, a separate group of people. There was no interaction or interfacing between them. That backup flight software was there to protect in case there was a flaw 
in the primary avionics software system that affected the four primary compu computers that were used. Now, backup flight software didn't have all the same capability as PASS. Uh, it had basically what you needed to uh, complete an ascent and get to orbit safely, or if you had a problem occur on entry, to get down to the ground. So uh, on, on ascent and entry, we flew with four computers running um, in parallel with each other and the backup uh, ready to go. And if there were any failures uh, that uh, you lost confidence in either the software or the GPCs, the crew could press a red button on the stick and instantly jump over to the backup flight software and then get into a safe place with that software. Any computer could take any of that software. If you got on orbit and realized that the BFS computer uh, that had BFS loaded into it had a, uh, a hardware problem, that was fine. You could load BFS for entry into any one of the other GPCs. The mass memory unit on board had several copies of both sets of software. So if you found an error in the software, maybe there was a, a, a coding problem or a, a, a corruption in one of the GPCs, you could reload the software from the mass memory unit and you would had actually several copies uh, to, to select from in case, again, somewhere on the mass memory unit, uh, there was a, a corruption or a failure. Incredibly flexible, incredibly redundant. The other key aspect that I think had a very positive impact on resiliency, but also on security, was a distributed architecture. And the space shuttle was one of the first vehicles to use this capability. So the idea is that you separate critical functions and then you're very careful and limit what information is allowed to pass between them and there are checks uh, to make sure that you protect that. So on orbit, we would shut down uh, three of the GPCs into basically into uh, uh, a, a warm mode. And uh, so that we could restart them if we needed to. We had one actually was, was warm as a warm backup and the other two were shut down completely. And then uh, in one computer, we had guidance, navigation, and control, very critical software, uh, controlling the vehicle, uh, knowing where its navigation state was, knowing where you were pointed, um, all very, very critical aspects of operating the vehicle. And then in another computer, we loaded systems management software, or SM software, and that had critical functions having to do with the systems, but the communications between these were very tightly structured. Well, we found pretty quickly that three CRTs was not enough information for the crew, especially as our missions began to get more complex on in the shuttle program. And so we added a third tier to the distributed architecture, a payload uh, general support computer, or PGSC. And that's a picture of the IBM ThinkPad uh, that I flew on my missions as a PGSC. Uh, each crew would carry somewhere between five and seven PGSCs. Um, they performed functions like uh, a world map so that you could just glance at the map and know exactly where over the earth you were. You could see critical things like uh, if there was a loss of communications coming up, a, a comm outage or something like that. But we used them heavily for mission support. In the bottom left picture is me and my friend Koichi Wakata had just completed a very complex robotics operation using the two PGSCs mounted behind us. Of course, in microgravity, it was pretty easy to mount those anywhere that you wanted to. They just uh, would stick with a little bit of Velcro uh, on, a, on a platform. And uh, the, those uh, PGSCs would take data from the GNC and the SM computers, but could not send anything back. So it was a, a one-way flow of data from the GNC computer or the SM computer to the PGSC. Now, in the bottom right-hand corner, you see a picture of the Rendezvous and Proximity Operations Program, or RPOP, which is an app that we used to visualize the uh, orbital mechanics between the shuttle and the station. And that picture was taken shortly after I docked to the space station, showing uh, my, my approach, my line of approach. Now, we also used these uh, 
laptops for email, but um, the email wasn't directly connected. In fact, uh, what would happen is the ground would sync up our mail three times a day. So, you know, three times a day we'd get a message from the ground, basically mail call, and, uh, you know, everybody would scramble for a computer uh, to check their email. <laughs> We could do that because we were only in space about 10 days to two weeks at a time. We also used it for file sharing and, and other things like that. The PGSCs were absolutely essential, but they were also very isolated and very protected. Now, this is a pretty happy story about the overall security of the shuttle software system and how we approached it. But that doesn't mean that we didn't have unanticipated issues, almost all of them resulting from complexity. So uh, we used uh, for many, many years on the, um, the space shuttle, inertial navigation units were the primary form of maintaining the navigation state, you know, where are you in space? And the ground could up, uplink information from a radar pass or something that gave us more precise information. But when the opportunity came to integrate a GPS receiver, uh, when they started to become uh, lightweight enough and ubiquitous enough, um, that was a great opportunity because we were doing um, high, highly precise navigation maneuvers like rendezvousing with the space station. Now, the first time we tested it was on STS-91. And of course, we were smart enough not to make the GPS receiver be the only generation of the nav state. In fact, we disconnected uh, the GPS receiver from the primary nav state of the GNC computer. So we didn't want to influence or upset that, but we wanted to monitor it. So there was an aiding state, basically a secondary state that the GPS receiver would periodically update. And that way we could sort of measure and see what the nav state would look like if the GPS receiver was updating it. Well, we had a little hiccup. The GPS receiver had a software anomaly and it basically went into a control alt delete type reboot situation. And unfortunately, at exactly the same time, the GNC computer sent a message to the GPS receiver asking for an update to the aiding state. Well, the GPS receiver never saw it. When it came back up on board, uh, it, was, it was, you know, not a flag that was set. And so it, as far as the GPS receiver was concerned, it had never been asked for the information and never provided it. So the GNC computer at that point said, uh-oh, GPS receiver is down. So stopped asking for updates from the GPS receiver. Now that aiding state uh, began to degrade, right? You're propagating a navigation state without putting any corrections in. And sooner or later, uh, the numbers started to go pretty funky and math errors began to be generated. No problem, right? No problem. I told you already, very limited information flows between the GNC computer and the systems management computer. Everything should be just fine. Well, there are two very important things that are communicated between the GNC computer, computer and SM. The first one is the NAV state. So the systems management computer knows where to point the antenna to talk to the ground. Unfortunately, when those math errors started to generate, the other type of information came into play, which is error codes. Of course, the systems management computer wants to know if there's a problem on the GNC computer. Well, the intercomputer -com communication bus got flooded with these math errors, which essentially choked out passing the nav state. So the systems management computer did not receive any updated shuttle state vectors, and eventually this antenna lost lock with uh, the satellite uh, that, that linked it to the ground. And one of the most serious problems that can happen in space is a loss of communications. And it happened while the crew was asleep. Well, MCC to the rescue, mission control, uh, was able to actually get in and figure out how to manually uh, uh, get, get, get a, uh, they, they eventually got, got a lock over a ground station. They sent a command to manually point the antenna at the TDRS satellite and, uh, and then uh, were able to, uh, to fix the problem. But it just points out that um, 
even you know it was really incredibly uh, resilient and uh, they thought through as many errors as they could but in a complex system like this you can still have problems now we learned a lot for the International Space Station um, I'd like to say we'd really upped our game uh, we learned a lot about security um, starting all the way with the ground system so even back in the Apollo days there was uh, not the capability to talk straight from Houston up to the spacecraft, but instead uh, a large set of antennas in White Sands, New Mexico, talking the, to the tracking and data relay satellite, which then communicates low data rate S-band audio information and high data rate KU band video and payload data. This entire network is completely owned by NASA. So uh, this is not going uh, through uh, open internet. There's no uh, cloud. This is uh, completely controlled to NASA. And of course, it's been uh, updated. So just an, another aspect of the security. Another interesting issue was around mission control commanding. Now, people weren't really thinking about hacking, but what they were thinking about is making mistakes. So an innocent mistake could send a bad command. Now that was true for the space shuttle too, but we had fewer controllers for the space shuttle, uh, all hands on deck the six times a year or seven times a year that the shuttle was flying. Um, so a high level of proficiency uh, in a, a very small pool of people. Well, with the International Space Station operating 365 days a year and 24-7, um, uh, we needed a lot more controllers. So there's a very rigorous certification process required for uh, controllers in the International Space Station Mission Control Center to allow them to send commands to the space station. In addition, there are screening protocols, both before it ever leaves MCC going up to the ISS and once it's on board ISS to check and make sure that that, uh, that command will not inadvertently do some damage to the station. And so uh, again, really all of these characteristics were really there for safety, but they have the added capability of adding to the cybersecurity as well. Now, distributed architecture. Uh, this uh, is at a whole new level on the space station. So starting with the command and control computers, multiplexer, demultiplexer, or MDMs, there's three command and control MDMs uh, that control the station. And just like the GNC and the SM computers on the shuttle, in this case, there are multiple separate payload and ISS element MDMs to control the system. So highly distributed in that regard. Uh, and again, with very strict rules about uh, bus traffic between them. Now, the crew on board the space station does not have cathode ray tubes, I'm very happy to report. Instead, they use a laptop called the Portable Computer System. I apologize for all the acronyms. This is what NASA does though. Anyway, the PCS, is used for a cr the crew to send commands to the ISS MDMs. It's essentially a remote terminal. It plugs in. Uh, they are not networked to each other. They are plugged directly into the station and can send commands. Now, they have the same issues that we did on the space shuttle, wanting more screens, more apps, more capability. And so there is an ops LAN uh, it is a local area network using station support computers. <laughs> These computers are used for procedures, email, and everything else, including Twitter. Now you may be wondering, because I told you on the space shuttle, we didn't have real-time access uh, to, the, to the internet. Well, that's a real hardship on the space station if you stop and think about that for a moment, because there are people living up there for six months. And I mean, just even really simple things like if you were up there for six months and maybe you wanted to go on the internet and buy your husband a birthday present and lots and lots of other things. So, uh, and of course the onset of Twitter, uh, which astronauts have embraced uh, completely. So uh, it took a fair amount of work uh, to set up the cybersecurity because uh, that was already a consideration even by then. So there's a computer inside the firewall at the Johnson Space Center that is the proxy computer. So the space station support computers talk to the proxy computer, which then goes out onto the internet. 
Now, of course, just like any computer, it's still subject potentially to malware. But the most important thing is the sp station support computers in no way, shape, or form are networked to the actual commanding of the station. They're completely separate systems and they, they don't talk to each other. And so a hacker might be able to get at uh, with great difficulty, but might be able to get at somebody's email on board the space station, but they couldn't take over controlling the station. Sort of the up uh, ultimate in a distributed architecture. So the use of computers is so important on the International Space Station. I just want to show an example, actually, of, of how they're used operationally. And this is a picture from my third flight in space where we had a lot of important robotics operations. So in the center of the screen, you will see three uh, videos. And then underneath the one on the left, and on the right are two hand controllers. They control the robotic arm of the space station. So that's how you move the arm is with those hand controllers. Now, I talked about the PCS, which does command, and it actually can send commands to the big arm. Turn it on, turn it off, switch power sources, and so forth. And so the PCS on the right was set up for ISS commands. And then there's a backup PCS set up in the middle. It enables you to quickly, if there's a hardware or software failure uh, to, on the primary PCS, you could go to the backup PCS very quickly. And in addition, it allows you to monitor other critical systems that interact with the robotic arm. And then the other three computers, the two above and the one to the left, are uh, part of the ops land. They're station support computers. They provide extra camera views, procedures, file sharing, et cetera, et cetera. Now, areas of concern in space systems for me. I'd like to shift gears a little bit and say uh, this is what I see out there that is worrying me. First of all, um, uplink and downlink to most satellites is encrypted, but the data on the bus itself is not. So, of course, uh, it's easy to say, well, there's no way to access it. It's just out there. It's in space. Uh, but in fact, um, I think it is an area of concern. It's something that we should be thinking about encrypting onboard traffic as well. Ground system vulnerabilities is probably the one place that if you're talking to a space person, they will acknowledge there is a cyber risk. Our ground systems uh, are very vulnerable. They're just as vulnerable as any enterprise uh, computer, uh, as part of any enterprise IT system. Something interesting, particularly in DOD, is that uh, all of the constellations and all of the satellites, most of them have completely unique ground systems. Now, DOD is moving away from that. They're having a common ground system going forward. But what that means is that they're all different. Now, the good news is, well, if you figured out an exploit in one, it wouldn't necessarily work on another one. But the flip side to that from an enterprise IT management standpoint is configuration management, patching, and so forth is a nightmare. So that, that is a real concern. And uh, fortunately, it's, it's being addressed in DOD. Edge computing. Well, the, the challenge uh, there is, you know, I had talked a little earlier about how man-in-the-middle attacks are kind of hard on satellites because real time, you have to see the data stream and then figure out what you want to inject into it. Well, Edge computing is uh, becoming increasingly important. Now, I mentioned the fact that in the past, it's been minimized to do computations on board. There was really just enough code and just enough hardware to run the satellite, run its payload, and then communicate all the data to the ground. And uh, that's, as I said, because it had weight implications. Well, with the advents of, advent of Moore's Law, satellites are becoming smaller and more efficient because their electronics are more efficient. So one of the challenges in low Earth orbit is as you whiz around the Earth every 90 minutes, you really can only downlink your information when you happen to be within sight of a ground station. And any one ground station you're only in sight of between five and 10 minutes. So you could take a picture, but you might actually end up waiting a half an hour before you can downlink it. Well, 
th that's actually a challenge uh, if you've got uh, very short periods of time to get a lot of data down. And so increasingly, we're moving into a place where there's more and more computation moving on board and uh, really getting high quality edge computing so that you can uh, do all the, the data management and that minimizes the amount of information that you have to downlink. I'm just going to send you a notification that something has occurred or I'll send you a highly processed picture of what you're most interested in instead of a giant data stream. Well, that is also going to make it a lot easier for man-in-the-middle attacks. Finally, the most uh, serious problem I think we have in aerospace is complacency. As I said, uh, many people in space think that their systems are not vulnerable to cyber. We have an attitude in aerospace. It's part of our culture and our values to think about safety. Safety is integral from design to test and verification and operations. We just think that way. We are going to have to figure out how to insert cybersecurity and an awareness of that into the values and the culture of aerospace all the way from the beginning in design and all the way through to operations. I really think we are going to need to do that. Now, fortunately, there's some exciting work being done on cyber physical systems. One of my favorite demonstrations was in the uh, Information Innovation Office, or I2O, at DARPA when I was there. So the DARPA High Assurance Cyber Military Systems Program, or HACMS. So the picture you see there is an optionally crewed helicopter called Little Bird built by Boeing. Now, the HACMS program gave a group of hackers access to the flight data recorder. And within 30 minutes, they had hacked their way into critical systems on the Little Bird, which really surprised everyone. So the HACMS program funded several performers to develop uh, security capability and a secure kernel. So I'm not a software person, but to me, a secure kernel is very much like the distributed architecture that I talked about for the shuttle and station. You have uh, a separation of critical functions and then you have a high level of restrictions about what information and checks in that, that go on for information that flows in and out of that critical area. This secure kernel um, was loaded into Little Bird. Those same hackers were given access in the same way and all they could do was shut down the flight data recorder, not very important, and point the camera. So it is possible to develop secure cyber physical systems. Now the HACMS program is over, but the System Security Integrated Through Hardware and Firmware program, or SIF, is, is still active. And those of you who were at DEF CON last year may remember that DARPA, uh, through the SIF program, brought a voting box, a voting computer, uh, to DEF CON uh, to work on the vulnerabilities and challenges of how to protect uh, that hardware system from software exploits. So I, I have high hopes. There's a lot of really good work going on. Um, I would like to see these uh, best practices and these technologies proliferate into space. So a lot of interesting trends in space that are going to have an impact on this. Um, some of you may be familiar with some of these uh, proliferated low Earth orbit or PLEO constellations like Starlink or OneWeb. Now, I talked about low Earth orbit and having to wait until you came over a ground station. Well, the idea here is to have enough satellites which are also connected through crosslinks through a mesh network such that if one satellite takes a picture, it can send the information through the mesh network to another satellite that's over a ground station. And so this would greatly increase the persistence and in, in fact uh, make it uh, data ubiquitous at any time. Now there's some real challenges with mesh networking. Um, um, so the Space Defense Agency is working on that uh, right now. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot more of these cross links and these mesh networks, which of course will increase the attack vectors as well. 
NASA is working on going to the moon and on to Mars. Their Moon to Mars program uh, is a program that, uh, just like the space station, they've reached out to international partners. So far, Europe, Japan, Canada, and Australia have all expressed interest in joining in going to the moon to prepare and develop the technologies that will allow us to go on to Mars. And uh, there will be a, an orbiting logistics platform called Gateway in lunar orbit. And then not too different from the International Space Station, a moon village made up of different elements that different countries have doing whatever science they're most interested in, but having shared infrastructure. As we push out into the solar system, we're going to need a lot more logistics hubs. So the most efficient way to get from point A to point B in space is through careful transfers of orbits, low Earth orbit to geosynchronous orbit, geosynchronous orbit to lunar orbit, geosynchronous orbit to Mars orbit. And you're go going to see these logistics hubs that allow us to refuel or even build new satellites, store and supply logistics, uh, and transfer uh, uh, not just uh, data, but also goods and supplies uh, out into the solar system. NASA's already thinking about solar system internet, but there's a big challenge with that. Communications is done through RF, and what that means is it's prone to blockouts and fading. Now, the way internet protocol works today is a packet that cannot show that it has connection all the way to its destination never gets sent. Well, you can't have that in space because you're going to have these blockages, these, this fading of, of signal periodically. So NASA has been working on delay tolerant networking that allows data to be cached uh, as it pushes out. Um, and so that way, if uh, there is a loss of signal, that's fine. It can tolerate microseconds up to seconds and then uh, pass along the information once the network is reestablished. Interestingly, this has implications as well. DARPA has also been working on it for disruption tolerant networking, and that's more for uh, emergencies, uh, uh, you know, disasters, humanitarian disasters, and things like that, where there's not a consistent capability uh, for the internet. And so, uh, dis dis delay or disruption tolerant networking is going to be incredibly important as we develop a solar system. Uh, uh, internet. So I just want to say um, how wonderful it is to be here and uh, thanks for inviting me to participate at the Aerospace Village. I'm very excited about Hackasat. I think it's a really great idea. Uh, idea. It's, it's a way to get insight into what the actual vulnerabilities are, just like we did the demonstration uh, for Hackums. But it's important to remember that the implications for space cybersecurity are huge. Even today, I talked about how much of our economy depends on GPS, weather, and so many other uh, pieces of data that we get from space. But there are bigger implications as we build out a solar system internet. We're really going to have the opportunity to completely think this through again and go on to Internet 2.0 technologies like delay tolerant networking and build in security from the beginning, which is something that we didn't do with Internet 1.0. So I'm hopeful that someone out there that's listening today uh, will have some ideas about how to build a more secure internet for the solar system and I'm just going to ask you to get cracking on that. Thank you.